Welcome to The War from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, today we're going to take a look at another Norman Corwin series. This one is called An American in England. And its goal was to let Americans know uh, what was going on in England, uh, how its people were faring, and what life was like for them uh, under the influence of uh, of the long war. Uh, initially this was done in cooperation with the BBC. The broadcast was set to originate uh, directly from London. However, its first uh, couple months of podcast were uh, sadly not particularly successful uh, with uh, some uh, with with some broadcast being unsuccessful, some being partially successful, and others plagued with technical difficulties. So it was decided that they would continue to tell the story of people in Great Britain, but that they would need to tell that story from CBS Studios. So in December, uh, the series returned to the air, but this time originating from the United States. And so we're going to play the first episode of that second um, part of America of an American in England. This air episode is entitled Cromer, and it originally aired December first, nineteen forty-two. So here now is Cromer. Cromer is a town on the east coast of England, and this is a true program about it. The program has to do with bombs and the postmaster and a rescue squad and an old church and a spitfire and several other matters. And it takes a half hour. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents An American in England. First of four programs written and directed by Norman Corwin, an extension of the transatlantic series of the same title, originally short-waved by CBS from London. Tonight, Cromer. A town is like a person. It has a character, a complexion, a name, it has a set of habits, it's hardworking or lazy, rich or poor, handsome or ugly. Some towns never amount to much, some get sick and die, some grow big and powerful and lead their race. But all towns, be they so great, they call themselves metropoli, or so small you'd miss them if you winked while driving through. All towns have this in common. They are mortal. They know seasons and the way of wind, each taking its share of sun and moon and standing up to storm. And they're mortal also in the respect of violence and death. For war may come to any and to all of them. Troy was a town. So was Jericho. Lidice was a town. Likewise, Our Lady, the Queen of the Angels of Porciuncula, later to be known as Los Angeles. And Cromer was a town, and is a town. You'll find it on a map of the east coast of England, in the district called East Anglia, facing the North Sea, facing Germany. I set out by train for Cromer one sunny September morning from a station in the east end of London. Uh, incidentally, you spell it with a C, not a K. C-R-O-M-E-R, Cromer. The things you notice on a train ride in a front-line country are not much different from the things you notice on a train ride anywhere. Small talk overheard, the beard of the man sitting opposite, 
The pattern of the hole punched in your ticket by the conductor? Change at Cambridge for Cromer. Yes, I know. Thank you. The little differences in railway manners, such as the etchings on the walls of the compartments, and the fact that when the steward comes through to announce lunch, he doesn't yell, first call for lunch, but says, those requiring lunch will please go forward to the dining coach. A lot of unimportant little things stick in your mind. In the smoker, for example, I overheard two officers, a Canadian and an Englishman, talking very earnestly about the war. I thought. Do you know what they were saying? But what does Coca-Cola taste like? Cocoa? Well, uh, no, no. It's sort of hard to describe. Does it taste like ginger? Well, it's more like molasses. No, that's not right either. Well, what's the other drink like? Well, Pepsi-Cola? Yes. Well, uh, I don't really know how to describe that either. Well, does it have a peppermint taste to it? No. No, it's about the same. Almost. I think. Things like that, you notice. They make up a journey. Also, cities and towns and fields, freshly plowed, aircraft overhead. And, of course, you notice the weather which changes every 15 minutes, like morning radio programs. When I got to Cromer, it was raining. I checked in at the police station, which is considered good form for visitors. Otherwise, you're liable to get pinched. May I see your passport? I handed the officer the original passport, which the State Department of the United States of America gave me as a farewell present when I left for England. And he fanned through it, studying all the visas and rubber stampings. Now, if I may see your national identity card. That's all I've troubled you for. No trouble at all. Nothing like making sure, is there? <laughs> if you lived 16 and a half minutes flying time from a Nazi airdrome, you'd want to make sure who was poking his nose into your business, too. Yes, these are all right. Where are you staying in, Cromer? Oh, I've got a reservation at the Red Lion Hotel. I see. Thank you very much. I hope you have a pleasant stay. Thank you. Good day. Which it wasn't, believe me. It was a miserable day. I... Plotted through the murk to the hotel, hardly noticing the town and its bomb damage as I went. And when I reached the Red Lion, which was standing proud and wet on the east cliff of Cromer, I found that its name was not the Red Lion, but Ye Olde Red Lion. That was a disappointment, because somehow I never really expected to meet up with Ye Olde, spelling E, in England. I thought the only place you found that stuff was in the tea shoppies and fancy hamburger joints on the state highways of New Jersey. Well, anyway, after I registered, I went upstairs, hoping to kick my shoes off in a warm room overlooking the North Sea. The chief maid of the Red Lion preceded me. Here's your room, sir. Bathroom's down the hall. It wasn't a warm room. It was a cold room. It didn't overlook the North Sea. It overlooked a brick wall. Have you no room facing the sea? No, sir. We've closed all the front rooms. Closed them? Yes, sir. Shut tight. What's the matter, ghost? Who oh, no, sir. On account of the blackout. How do you mean, on account of the blackout? Well, you see, there's no way of checking from the waterfront to make sure there's no light coming from windows facing the sea. So we're not allowed to rent rooms facing the water. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought of that. Yes, sir. So, good day. You know how it is. You get in a place and right away you want to see what it looks like. I put on a raincoat and went out of the Red Lion into the gray day. The narrow streets were almost deserted. The buildings of the town seemed huddled together for warmth. The Hotel de Paris dripped sadly, as though grieving for the city whose name it bore. On high streets, a few shoppers went in and out of rest department store. The pubs were closed until four. I climbed Lighthouse Hill and sat on a rock looking down on Cromer and the sea. There it was, the unimportant town of Cromer, Norfolk County, that sleepy place with a mist on her. There was the church, the pier, the beach, the town, all in one tight little landscape. And I thought, as the gentle rain from heaven dripped down my neck, what could the axes possibly want with a harmless little shore town on the North Sea? Obviously, the same things they've wanted and managed to get in certain shore towns strung out along the Baltic. The Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the China Sea. 
They want your money and your life, that's all. They just want to own you and your country. What they got in shore spots like Trondheim and Manila, they'd like to get in Cromer and Points West. By this time, I was cold and wet enough to leave Lighthouse Hill, which I did in search of a pub. The first one I came to had a sign over the door. Courage. Fully licensed. Name of an ale manufacturer who owns a chain of pubs. Maybe their ale gives you courage. I couldn't say. I happen to be drinking milder stuff. What's yours, please? A mild and bitter. Mild and bitter? Right. I leaned on the counter. Pretty soon a man came in. Middle age, looked like a businessman. He ordered ale, stood alongside for a bit, then, marking me as a stranger, started up a conversation. There's a very simple way to do that, and it's based on the universal taste for tobacco. I say, uh, would you like a cigarette? Oh, thank you very much. He felt it talking, and it turned out he was a native of Cromer. He was proud of the town. And you should have seen this town in summer before the war. But it wasn't a season went by we didn't handle 75,000 people here, including transients. That's so. Uh, our eight biggest hotels used to be jam-packed from June to September. The autumn rain kept beating down on the roof as he talked and made it hard to imagine Cromer ever having been a gay and busy and sunlit town. But he revived it and gave it life, lighting up the dim pub with his account of concerts on the pier and the pavilion crowded with fun makers and the putting greens and the bowling lawns doing business late into the night. And excellent bathing here, too. And one of the best things about Cromer is the fact that there's no objection to sunbathing. Oh, uh, provided it's done decently, of course. Any fishing and boating? Oh, yes, yes. Good catches of whiting and flatfish. You see, we're not far from the uh, Norfolk Broad. Who are they? Who? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. That's, uh, that's down the coast. Uh, uh, what about the weather here? Uh, uh, uh. That threw him on the defensive. I didn't mean the question that way. We're actually in the driest part of England. Now, as a matter of fact, the late Empress of Austria used to come here for her help. You mean the late Empress of the late Austria? Oh, yes, rather. <laughs> Fill them up again, gentlemen. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Here, I've got this. Oh, no, 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 please. No, this is mine. For another round, this went on. The story of happy Cromer before the rise of the fascists. And then I asked him what the war had done to the town. And he told me a hundred little stories of how life had changed here. How some of the men of Cromer had gone away to fight and had been killed... Some had stayed home and been killed. How the town's fishing and crabbing industry had been ruined. And seven of its eight hotels shut down. How the people stood up during the bombing. And how they organized to take on their share of the war. Then he lowered a glass of ale and said to me, Well, it's been a big job for a little town. So we took our beating just like London and Coventry and Swansea and all the rest. And I think we've done a... Pretty well, considering. He looked at his watch and decided it was time to leave. I left with him. The proprietor waved a friendly dish rag at us. Well, good night, gentlemen. God bless. Good night, Tom. The rain had let up. And for a couple of minutes in the gathering dusk, we walked without speaking. Cromer was still after the rain. Only the sound of dripping eaves. The far off bus starting up in low gear. What's that, a Wellington? No. No, that's a Beaufort fighter. Long range fighter. Not making any local stops, is he? No, oh, very fast shift, go fighter. Get many alerts here? Well, we've had our share. Sometimes the jerrys come in low to avoid detection and drop bombs before we have a chance to sound an alert. That must make you feel nice and secure. Oh, don't worry. We do the same to them. I hope so. Incidentally, did you know that Cromer is the nearest place in the British Isles to Germany? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Well, my geography must be screwy. I always thought that Cromer... Hey, this place got a whack, didn't it? Yes. Whole family wiped out here last July. What a mess. Man and his wife, her mother and father, two children, all killed. Gosh. I'd seen acres and acres of bomb damage in London, but they were all tidied up like the ruins of Pompeii by the time I got there. 
This was my first close-up of the house, just as it had been left by a high-explosive bomb. Would you like to walk on the ruins? Well, if it's all right to do so. Oh, yes, come on. It was a weird sensation walking over this debris, in which a family had been murdered. There was a torn black slipper, woman's, the leg of a table, picture frame, a pie-shaped fragment of crackery plate, the head of a doll. Granny and Gramp and Mom and Pop and the kids. Dead. Done in by the fashion. The war of the Luftwaffe against the scullery table and the chest of drawers and the clean sheets in the linen closet. Little Pamela, who played with the doll, wants to be remembered to Fritz Tyson, the industrialist who backed Hitler because he wanted to keep the people down. She says, good evening, Mr. Tyson. How are things in Switzerland? Mom's big serving dish, which she bought at the fair in Norwich, was smashed in several pieces. Now Mom is wondering whether the magazine publisher who thinks a little fascism might be good for America would care to repair the dish. The kitchen clock and the china toilet bowl and the middle plank of the dining room table send their respects to Rudolf Hess and ask after his health. And Pop, being the head of the family... I'd like to write an inscription in that book written by Lord Londonderry, the one which admires the Fuhrer. Mom and Pop and the old folks and the kids were sleeping on the premises when it happened. And they're sleeping not far from here right now. That's how to keep the people down, all right, Tyson. They're down all the way. Put them down. I won't hear from them again. It was dark. A few stars were showing through broken clouds. The weather was clearing. I said goodbye to my friend and went back to the hotel for dinner. same one who showed me to my room, also waited on table. Every time she served anything, she said, thank you. I was intrigued by the effect when she distributed rolls to a group of six men sitting at a table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She thanked her way through a three-course meal, which left me still hungry. And afterward, I went down to the lounge and struck up a conversation with a pleasant white-haired, white-mustached man who turned out to be chairman of the Urban District Council, a sort of board of selectmen. He was H.A. Mitchell, Justice of the Peace. I asked him about the town government, and he told me how it was set up. As for me, I'm a member of the Labor Party. Is this a labor town? Oh, no. Conservatives. In fact, it's all a stronghold. Well, how is it you were elected? <laughs> Nobody can figure that out. <laughs> Maybe just because they liked you. Well, they didn't always like me. I remember the time when the Chroma crowd knocked me down and set my hat on fire. Why? Why'd they do that? They were so bitter about my representing labor. Good heaven. But I've been elected twice since then, so you could say you were progressing, couldn't you? Sure could. After they'd burnt my hat, I used to bring it round every election and display it under a sign which said... Tory arguments. <laughs> Personally, I think the Tories have burnt all their hats behind them. Oh, well, I don't know. They've learned some manners. Why, there was a man tried seven times to get on the council here, and he was defeated each time. Finally, he was invited to become a member. I asked Mitchell whether the town figured in any special war activity. Well, I was asked by the United Nations to have a little service on United Nations Day. And did you? Oh, yes. I could just see the United Nations asking the chairman of the Comer Council to hold a service. There'd be a round-robin letter signed by the leaders of 30 nations. And the White House 
In Washington, Steve Early would remind the president... Frank, don't forget to send a message to H.A. Mitchell about that service in Cromer. While in the Kremlin, Joe Stalin would sign a note. Was previous William Tovarich Mitchell. And Churchill would ask his secretary... Get uh, Mitchell on the phone and tell him there's a pile of petitions from our allies uh, waiting here for him. And why not? Isn't Cromer on the side of the United Nations? Belonging to them? Its future tied up with theirs? Its men fallen for the same good reasons? All honor to Mitchell for saying it the way he did. Well, the gathering in the lounge broke up, and I went along to bed. As I undressed, I heard a plane coming over. I remember that we were 16 and a half minutes flying time from a Nazi airdrome, and that sometimes the Hun dropped bombs before an alert could be sounded. But having been three months in England, this troubled me the way it must have worried H.A. Mitchell. I slept like a rock on the Norfolk coast. satisfaction of the salvage worker who helped win a prize. We here in Cromer won the East Anglia salvage contest. Got first prize of a hundred pounds. That's swell. What'd you do with the money? Oh, well, we gave 50 pounds to the hospital, 25 to the District Nursing Association, and 25 to the Red Cross. And the bombed out landlady on Overstrand Road who told me... Gee, it's hard. Very hard. Most of the rooming houses have been ruined. Bombs, you mean? No, no. I mean ruined as businesses. We never had a season before the war when we couldn't rent rooms. But with evacuation and no bathing in the summertime, some of us have had to sell our furniture and move out. And the fisherman whose trawler had been attacked by a fucker wolf and whose son had been killed. Do you know what the town went and done? We adopted a minesweeper. Adopted one? How do you mean? We sent it a wireless set and a whole shelf of books. A nineteen pounds in cash. What's the name of the minesweeper? HMS Cromer. And then there was George Lusby, foreman of Cromer's rescue squad. Said he memorized the location of 300 shelters around town so he could find any one of them in the dark. It's very difficult in the dark to distinguish between bodies and rubble because the bodies are so covered with dust. Well, uh, don't you ever feel squeamish? I mean, blood and stuff. Oh, you don't mind it when you're working on an emergency. It's when you get quiet moments later that reaction might set in. Worst things are the disappointments. What do you mean? Well, it's most disappointing to dig and dig. Find the man you're digging for is dead. I went down to the post office. It was opposite the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, and you could hear the organist practicing across the way. The postmaster explained that the stained glass windows of the church had been blown out when the bomb struck, and so there was nothing to stop the sound from crossing the street and filling the post office. We work in an odor of sanctity, you see. I asked him whether the post office had been much affected by the war. Uh, there's no comparison between the amount of mail we handle now and what we used to handle before the war. Lost any personnel? Our postman was injured when the office was hit, but there was no interruption in the service, though. The bomb struck around midnight. But in spite of the damage, we managed to get the nine o'clock mail out on time the following morning. How on earth did you do it? Well, we moved everything we needed into the lecture hall of the Band of Hope. <laughs> That's a teetotaler organization here in Cromer. We had to dig out our equipment and move it through the rain. Who was that? A German plane attacking? No, that just a bit fire. Gunnery practice. See, you, you can see the plane ahead of him towing the target sleeve. 
I watched this for a while. The accompaniment of Ye Holy Angels Right from the church organ. And then I left keeping a point. The last visit I made in Cromer was to the home of its most famous son, Henry C. Block. He'd been described to me as the all-time superman of lifeboat service. Saved 626 lives. Medals from George V and George VI. I went to see him where he lived in a small house down near the waterfront. He was in his 70s. Still husky. His handshake was firm. His eyes sharp. I asked him a foolish question. How it felt to be awarded so many medals. Uh, you have to pack up and go to London to get the medals. They don't let you escape. Where do you keep your medals, Mr. Blogg? I don't see them here anywhere. My old lady's got them. He looked around quickly to see whether his wife had heard that. London always seems a devil of a long way to go for a medal. I coaxed him into telling me some of his exploits. He told me about the night when eight ships were wrecked off Cromer. About another time when he deliberately ran his lifeboat onto the deck of a wrecked freighter in the midst of a gale because that was the only way he could rescue 16 men aboard. Once he mentioned lazy wind, I asked him what a lazy wind was. A lazy wind is a wind that's too lazy to go around you, so it goes through you. He showed me his medals reluctantly. Two kings gave me these gold ones. Hmm, imagine. Life saving is only a sideline with me. I make my living fishing and renting beach huts. Uh huh. I don't believe lifeboat crews should get paid. Why? Wouldn't get as good results. He was very firm about that. I figured he should know. After all, any man who saves 626 lives has earned the right to refuse to accept money for it. So I said goodbye to Mr. Blogg and headed back to the Red Lion. Drifted into the lounge of the hotel, sat by the bay window looking out on the sea. There was a copy of the Norwich News on the table with headlines of a raid elsewhere in East Anglia that morning. And the man I met at the pub came in. Hello. Hello. He sat down beside me and asked me a leading question. Well, uh, you like what you've seen of Cromer? Yes, thank you very much. A good many things have changed here, you know. Is that so? Mm-hmm. But the changes are nothing compared to what we'll see when the war's over. You think so? Mm, got to be changes. We've got to do better about getting along with other people. No reason all kinds of people can't be friends. That's right. Oh, we all of us had a lot of silly ideas before the war. Wouldn't you agree? Don't you think there'll be changes everywhere, right here? Here in Cromer? Certainly, why not? What's the matter with Cromer? Oh, nothing's the matter. I, I well, was... all I can say is that if there aren't changes in Cromer after the war, I mean good things, better things for everybody. Then we've just been wasting our time, that's all. If not, I say, Cromer's just wasting its time. At that point, his eye happened to fall on the Norwich News, and he picked it up and got lost on page one. I returned to the big window. It was getting dark in the east. The European night, with all its menace and secret movement, was even now over the country of the enemy. About a half mile offshore, some cargo ships rode at anchor. And my thoughts rode at anchor, too. I thought of the faces I had seen that day. The faces of our allies here in the little town of Cromer. I thought of what these people had said to me. Cromer won the East Anglia salvage contest. Oh, you don't mind working in an emergency. It's when you get quiet moments later that reaction might set in. Two kings gave me those gold medals. Better things for everybody. If not, Cromer's just wasting its time. I drew a bead on the first star of the evening, which had just risen on the horizon. And I wondered, as I gazed at it, about the biggest salvage contest of all time. And who would win it? I wondered whether, when the world gets quiet moments later, a new brand of reaction might not set in. And whether anything was being planned ahead to avoid it. I wondered whether, maybe on some golden day, humanity itself might not rate a medal in the greatest of the king. Sorry, I've got to do the blackout. Excuse me. 
I don't know what it was that made me ask the maid, but I turned to her in a sort of a trance and said, You don't think Cromer is wasting his time, do you? She looked at me greatly puzzled and moved away, saying, No, I don't guess it is. And I've thought about it since. And the more I think of it, the more I'm sure that Cromer is not wasting its time. You have been listening to Cromer. Written and directed by Norman Corwin as the first of a series of four special programs entitled An American in England and presented by CBS as an extension of the international series of the same name originally broadcast from London. Joseph Julian, the narrator of the London production, served in that capacity again tonight. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Next week, notes at random. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. for today. If you uh, have a comment, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I welcome your story or that of loved ones who served during World War II. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, kencurlin.com. I am your host, Adam Graham. This uh, series is provided as a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net.